Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Scarborough Gilwood, uh, who will uh, be able to complete uh, his remarks after uh, oral questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank you again for the opportunity to uh, speak on this motion. May I say that I largely agree with it and welcome the opportunity for Parliament to weigh in on this debate. We are a nation in a state of asymmetrical conflict with the world's emerging superpower and about to be the world's largest economy. The stakes actually couldn't be much higher. The Communist Party of China has shown itself to be a collection of diplomatic and military thugs unworthy of a great nation. We have watched as the government of China enslaves an entire Uyghur population and then deny that it's done so, and then argues that really this is just an internal matter and not anyone else's business. Reports by respected NGOs such as Amnesty International are dismissed out of hand, and well-founded accusations by our own United Nations ambassador are ridiculed. The pattern is, Madam Speaker, first denial, then distraction, then a fact-free counter-accusation. We saw it again in Hong Kong. The one country, two systems agreement between Great Britain and China uh, of 20 years good standing got ripped up overnight when Hong Kongers robustly embraced their democratic rights. Now, Hong Kong is a mere appendage of the Communist Party in, uh, in Beijing and entirely dependent upon its political masters. Once again, the pattern is to deny the facts, ridicule and set up a distraction, and then develop a fact-free counter-narrative all the time, kidnapping activists and impeding the exit of those citizens of Hong Kong who feel that they are no longer safe. In Taiwan, we watch a belligerent Chinese Communist Party fly provocative military missions in Taiwanese airspace. It's abundantly clear, Madam Speaker, that the full and free expression of the democratic will of the citizens of Taiwan and the peaceful transition of power are an anathema to the Communist Chinese Party. And then we watch the military build up a bases on the shoals in the South China Sea, threatening the entire region, including the countries of Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, etc. It's again a full-scale demonstration of fact-free denial. We witness the conversion of shoals from incidental islands to military bases goes from outright denial as though satellite photos are fake, to claiming, claiming its internal right and therefore no one else's business, interlaw, international law be damned, to a counterfactual propaganda that these buildings are only for peaceful purposes, notwithstanding the menace uh, that both that all the Philippines and Vietnam and Thailand, Thailand see. We could circle the globe, Madam Speaker. Sri Lanka might surely have regrets over its Faustian bargain concerning its harbor. Many African countries rue the day that they let the Communist Party of China build local infrastructure. The Belt and Road Initiative is a policy that seeks to strangle independent nations and bend their resources and sovereignty to Chinese purposes. I have to interrupt the member now for um, uh, statements by members. You will have five minutes and 50 seconds after oral questions. Uh, statement China. For Scarborough Gilwood has uh, six minutes left uh, in his uh, debate. The Honourable Member. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think I left off on the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is a policy that seeks to strangle independent nations and bend their resources and sovereignty to the will of, uh, of Beijing. To say that the pattern is not happening here, Mr. Speaker, would be naive. 
The most obvious initiative is the supply of Huawei gear to the building of our 5G network. Security analysts have consistently raised the alarm that any Chinese company operating abroad, be it Huawei, China Telecom, Comnet, et cetera, owes its first and foremost loyalty to Beijing. The obvious security threat is the exchange of sensitive security information among our allies, be they Five Eyes, NATO, et cetera, but it's actually much deeper. The government of China has learned that the new gold is data. Exchanges among and between companies of hugely valuable intellectual property can be and are frequently hacked. But the most insidious use of the control of technology is people. The government of China, China through its various affiliates uses artificial intelligence capability and its control of networks to quote unquote, scrape facial recognition data to control populations. These systems are already operative in China. So Mr. Speaker, when all of our allies, NATO, Five Eyes, Sweden, which is largely a neutral country, and uh, companies such as Telus, Bell, Rogers, et cetera, ban Huawei and other Chinese companies, they're doing it for good reason. It's not only in our, our national security interest, but it's also in, in our interest to protect and secure corporate data. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, it is for the right, it is the right of every citizen to expect that the government of Canada will protect his or her basic freedoms of speech, movement, worship, etc., from the intrusions of a foreign government. According to Global Affairs Canada, as of March this year, China had 163 accredited diplomats working in Canada, as compared, Madam Speaker, to a mere 146 for the United States, far and away our most important economic and political partner. And as compared to 22 from the United Kingdom, far and away our second most important political partner. Interestingly, Madam Speaker, twice the number of Chinese diplomats are located in Toronto as are United American diplomats. Curious, isn't it, Madam Speaker? Should we all believe that these diplomats are fervently working to foster peaceful and mutually beneficial relations between our two nations? Or is there something else we should believe? What are 43 accredited uh, Chinese diplomats doing uh, proximate to uh, the largest research university and health network in Canada? We have seen that some universities have felt it necessary to disinvite certain Confucian institutions from their campus. Now, I realize, Madam Speaker, that all this sounds just slightly paranoid, but maybe, maybe I can, in closing, share a little experience I had in the last election. A small number of liberal candidates were invited to the, the campus that is proximate to my riding, the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. After uh, the usual set of speeches and question and answer, a young woman came up to me to describe her experience. Her name is Kenny, Kemi Lamo, and she was elected as the student president of the University of Toronto campus. She is Tibetan. After her election, her Instagram was flooded with literally thousands of complaints about her election, her person, her ethnicity, and many are not to be repeated here in the House of Commons. Now, Ms. Speaker, Madam Speaker, you and I have been around student politics, and you know, as do I, that apathy is the usual standard for university elections. Isn't it just a little curious that this young woman should be so, uh, and it so gener generate so much online hatred and venom? Madam Speaker, the reality is that the Chinese Communist Party is here and it operates both openly and clandestinely. And its ultimate goal is to turn Canada into a vassal state. The sooner we do something about it, the better off we'll all be. I thank for the movers of this motion for this timely debate, and uh, I look forward to any questions that colleagues may have. Thank you again for your time and attention. Uh, questions and comments? Uh, questions and commentaires? The honorable member for Sherwood Park, Port Saskatchewan.
Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank my colleague for his speech. I thank him for raising the case of uh, Ms. Lamo, uh, and there have been other uh, similar cases involving, for instance, the University of McMaster, where students who have sought to uh, raise important issues or simply have existed on campus have faced uh, intimidation. And uh, Conservatives raised some of these issues uh, at the Canada-China Committee yesterday in questioning of the Minister for Immigration uh, to see if, in some of these cases, uh, there was any, any incidents of, uh, of those involved in this intimidation having who, who are international uh, who were not Canadian citizens having their their status revoked uh, any instances of charges laid of diplomats being expelled uh, and there's just no indication that actions were taken by the government in in response to uh, these these terrible situations so I wonder if the member uh, could comment on what action uh, should be taken in these kind of cases secondly I want to ask him about supports to victims of intimidation Amnesty International has highlighted the lack of support for victims Victims of foreign intimidation. What can we do to better support people like Ms. Lamo uh, who face these these kinds of challenges? Our member for Scarborough Guildwood. I thank the uh, honourable member for his insightful uh, questions. Um, there are um, a number of actions that can be taken, and um, and I have some considerable confidence in the ability of. Uh, CSIS, RCMP, various uh, border services agencies, etc., uh, that would have um, have uh, specific and identifiable knowledge uh, concerning uh, the instances that he raises. Um, so I uh, I take the view that um, uh, the government of Canada is actually uh, fully aware of many of the uh, issues that he raises. raises. Um, I do think, however, that um, we could do better in terms of offering uh, refuge and support for those who find themselves as uh, victims of this intimidating process. And, uh, and if this debate does anything today and it moves that, uh, that issue forward, I think uh, we'll actually done something that's uh, useful for all Canadian citizens. And comments, the honourable members for uh, Central Okanagan, Samilkameen Nicola. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I certainly appreciate the member's intervention in this important debate. I uh, respect his views on, on many of these issues. Uh, he's been chair of Public Safety Committee, among other things. Uh, I, I would like to just ask the member, he's raised specifically some of the research and development that happens on Canadian universities. Abs absolutely, I agree with the member that if uh, individual Canadians, whether they be on campus or whether they be uh, anywhere in this country, um, intimidation is a non-starter. But many universities, and I'm sure, uh, you know, I, I was touring a facility that any of us would jump at an opportunity to see, and I asked them to see if the government could do anything. And they said specifically, we have asked our security apparatus and we've asked political uh, leaders to tell us who we can partner with and under what situations. Um, and so this is a, an issue that is lingering. It's causing not just the intimidation of our, uh, our citizens, but also causing issues on universities as to who they can partner with on research, particularly Chinese companies uh, that may have national security legislation applied to them. Member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you again for another excellent question from my colleague from Okanagan. Um, he hits on uh, possibly one of the greatest dilemmas of, um, of Canadian um, uh, life, and that is that we conduct our research in a relatively open fashion, that there is a free and full and fair exchange among colleagues, and that's actually the way scientific knowledge is advanced. The uh, Chinese government, because of their actions, have uh, brought into question that entire premise of our research. And the consequence is the, the real question for the universities and all of the research institutions is, who do you trust? And um, I think we are all still feeling our way on who do you trust and how do you cope with a company uh, and, a research, and research funding, which does not have the best interests of Canadian citizens in, in mind. Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable